Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Gary Lowe. For the last three months or so, I've been serving as the Director of Expertising for the American Philatelic Society. That doesn't mean that I do expertising. It means that I direct the activities of um, about 180 members of our expert committee. So I'm, I'm involved in herding cats more than I am in, in figuring out whether stamps are genuine or not, no, although I'm learning quite a bit about how to figure out whether stamps are genuine. If you're curious about that aspect of, of my little world, I'll be doing a presentation right on the show floor at 1 o'clock called Adventures in Expertizing. And uh, for the last three months, I can assure you I've been having lots of adventures. Um, but I first came back to the, I started collecting two-thirds of a century ago, uh, but really came back to the hobby seriously uh, in 2007. That's when I joined the APS. And I, my next year, I went to the APS Summer Seminar. If you don't know about it, you don't know what you're missing. It is a week-long exercise in philatelic learning, held once a year in June. Um, just a marvelous experience. So I've been going since 2008. In 2010, I came up with the idea that I would like to see a course in how to read and interpret a cover. Uh, two years later, they uh, took my recommendation. They got David Strait, the late, wonderful David Strait, to teach that course in how to read and interpret a cover. Um, a couple years later, the APS asked me to teach that course. I didn't think I was ready. So I went out and I started looking for a book on how to do postal history. How do you learn about doing something? There's, there's hundreds, literally hundreds of books on postal history out there, but it's always the postal history of this place or that time or some function like the postal history of the registered mail. It's always about the postal history of something. There's no book about how to do postal history. Um, Jack Caulfield, who's the author of Chicken Soup for the Soul, and a guy who knows something about writing and, more importantly, about selling books. He's sold about half a billion copies of the different versions of uh, Chicken Soup. Um, he says that uh, if you can't find the book you're looking for, you're fated to write it. So for the last several years, that's what I've been doing, writing a book that, um, that I started calling Mastering Postal History, which is the title of my talk today. The book today is being called uh, Fundamentals of Postal History. I think that sounds a little bit more lofty. Um, but it's going to take me a while to get that done. Um, 43 chapters, something over 500 pages, and I don't think I'm close to half done yet. So at some point, scope control is going to become a real problem. In any event, um, I ended up doing a one-day course as an on-the-road course in um, how to read and interpret a cover. And that expanded into a four-day presentation on, on the topic. But um, I've only got two hours this morning. W so I can't possibly go through all of what had been a one-day course and then a four-day course. I'm going to cherry-pick I hope it is satisfying for you because in two hours it's really, it's really going to be um, something of an issue. But um, this, this talk is really about three things. Setting up a framework within which you can research, analyze, and interpret um, your, your postal artifacts. And a cover, which is what everybody seems to call postal history, a cover is a postal artifact. It's something that's left, o left over, preserved from, uh, from some sort of postal activity. Certainly a cover is not the only kind of postal artifact. Um, but we'll get into this, this uh, framework. Uh, and then an approach to identify on your covers what's, um, what's noteworthy or what are the significant features about the individual cover. Um, stamps printed by the millions or billions. Covers 
tend to be pretty close to unique. Your cover is going to be different than my cover, even if they were mailed on the same day from the same place to the same place. They're all unique in some aspect or another. So how do you figure out what's, um, what's important, what's significant, what's noteworthy? Then I'm going to introduce you to a taxonomy of cover elements. Um, the classic approach to postal history has got what I, what I call the four pillars of postal history. Rates, routes, means of transportation, and the postmarks that appear. Rates, routes, means, and marks. That's classic postal history. To do a really thorough job to master an understanding of a cover, you need to go into much greater depth and, and, and a much more diverse spectrum of analysis. So I developed a taxonomy, and let's see if I can actually get this to work. Um, I want to show you really quickly. Oh, there it is. Okay. Um, there are 23 different elements, and I'm not seeing this on my screen, so you'll have to bear with me here. Um, nope. Not going to work. Anyway, um, let me pause and say that my slide presentation and this document, which codifies the, uh, the analytical framework, the taxonomy that I've developed, are going to be available to you if you leave me a card with your uh, uh, email address or take one of my business cards and send me an email. I will gladly share those two files with you so you've got some permanent uh, digital record um, of what we went over today. But anyway, so the, the third aspect is going to be that, uh, uh, that taxonomy. Um, I'll show you what to look for. Um, the key, though, is I don't care how smart you are, how educated you are, how, how familiar you are, you got to do your homework on every individual cover. Some of them are pretty obvious and pretty simple. Some of them, as we will see, are overwhelmingly and intimidatingly uh, complex. But you got to do the research in every case. The only way to learn how to do postal history is to do the research. Um, in this talk, in two hours, I don't have time to get into the complexity of the really deliciously interesting covers that are out there and show you uh, how to deconstruct them and reassemble them into a meaningful narrative. Uh, but on, uh, what was it, on Thursday here, I, d I did a, an all-day seminar on the sea posts. So um, I want to extract from that, and I'm going to hop over to a different uh, PowerPoint. I want to extract from that program that I did uh, a couple of days ago and show you um, an example of how to analyze a cover using those, f those four pillars, rates, routes, means, and marks. Um, this is a presentation, a PowerPoint presentation, that, um, that Dick Winter was gracious enough to let me steal from him. And... Um, it's really part of uh, one of his books on the transatlantic mails. So um, if you're looking for references and your interest is, is in transatlantic mail, there's a two-volume set by Dick Winter that, uh, that goes through cover by cover each of these, um, these four aspects. His recommendation is determine the cover's itinerary. How did it travel from where to where? What, where did it stop in between? Evaluate the cover's postal markings, the hand stamps and hand scribbles. Um, identify applicable postal conventions if there are any. We grew up in the age of the UPU, the Universal Postal Union, which started back in, uh, well, uh, as the General Postal Union back in uh, 1875. Before that, there were these bilateral agreements between individual nations. That's how postage rates were uh, determined. That's how they were negotiated. 
uh, with these uh, conventions. They weren't treaties, although they're frequently misidentified as treaties, but they were, they were conventions negotiated between postal authorities, not the higher level negotiations between nations. That's what would make it um, a treaty. Not treaties, even, even though they're called that. Occasionally, one or two were negotiated at that level for who knows what reason. Um, but for the most part, they're uh, conventions. Um, once you know the convention, if any, you can uh, parse the rating on the cover, figure out why it was franked or paid the way it was. For example, here's, <laughs> here's a lovely, lovely cover. This is again from uh, Dick Winter's uh, uh, book and presentation. And if you look carefully, and I'll help you look carefully, look at a stamp on that. That's, uh, that's not a U.S. postage stamp. That's before the postage stamps. That's a postmaster provisional. It's a 9X1 in the catalog. Um, the first U.S. postage stamp was issued in 1947. But in 19... F uh, I'm sorry, 1847. In 1846 and before, the postmasters knew what the rates were going to be. They knew stamps were coming out. Some of them, like this one in New York, the postmaster made their own stamps. Postmaster provisionals, they're at the very front of the U.S. section in your Scott catalog. And um, this is a pricey piece. I would guess if this thing showed up at, uh, in the market, there'd be a $4,000 cover or something like that. Uh, they're, not, they're not unseen in my role as director of expertising. I see them yeah, a couple, three times a month now. So they're out there, but um, they're, they ain't cheap. Anyway, uh, this cover traveled um, in April of, of 1846 from New York to Marseille. Dick Winter parsed out the um, itinerary because it started in New York, but the ship was departing from Boston, so the mail was made up in New York, bundled together, everything that was, was going uh, across the ocean, and uh, shipped up to, moved up to Boston, and put aboard the, uh, the ship, the Caledonia, which was part of the Cunard fleet. And the next day, uh, May 1st, it sailed. Uh, departed Boston. 14 days, 13 days later, it arrived at Liverpool. Now, this was uh, oh, 10 years into the age of steamships. Before that, they were all sailing vessels. So, uh, 13 days heading eastward uh, across the Atlantic is pretty decent, pretty standard time. And um, the next day, on the 15th, the letter got to London, one day from Liverpool to London. Uh, today, it would probably take longer. Uh, from, from London, it, it crossed the Channel and got to Paris two days later on the 17th. And then on the, 20, on the 20th, it had traveled all the way from Paris down south to the seaport in Marseille. As far as rates are concerned, you can see here the New York five cent paid. That paid the domestic postage from the inland postage from New York to Boston was a nickel. And um, that's a five cent stamp. Um, in London, when it arrived, it was stamped with this. That London Mark says colonies, etc. Article 13, that tells you two things. Number one, tells you that even in 1846, the Brits hadn't gotten over the fact that we were once a colony. Um, but also, I, actually, that's not true. It, it meant anything coming from British colonies. It, the, we were part of the etc. by that point in time. But the Article 13 is the bilateral agreement between um, Great Britain and France 
that determined what the rate was. Um, and in fact, that rate, as, as agreed upon, was three shillings, four pence for per ounce, which is what would be debited to France. And um, in Paris, it was marked at 21 decimes. That scribble is 21. I think postal clerks in that time period took courses in how to scribble and with intent to confuse future postal historians. It's the only explanation I've come up with. But um, anyway, um, that 21 decimes postage due was collected from the recipient. That's the 10 decimes which was due to the UK and the 11 which is the internal rate in France at that point in time. So this is the uh, eight or Article 13 is the 1843 Anglo-French Convention. Okay, so let's jump back now to um, the talk as I was intending to give it because I'm already behind schedule. Uh, we'll take a look at what is postal history. I'll give you a brief introduction to the taxonomy of cover elements. We'll talk about what is a cover, um, what's a postal artifact for that matter. Um, I will spend a little bit more time going over the, uh, the four pillars, rates, routes, means, and marks. We'll look at postal services. What are the different kind of services you could purchase when you were mailing, a, uh, mailing an envelope? Uh, and what would get affixed to that cover uh, to indicate some of those uh, postal services. Um, then we'll talk about other aspects of significance or noteworthiness. But what is postal history? I'm, I've never seen a definition that made me happy, including my own. Um, off the website of the Postal History Society, which is, if you're interested in this stuff, that's, you got to be a member of that. But postal history tells the story of how mail has been handled, who handled it, and why. No, that's okay. I think it's way too limiting. I think postal history is a way of is a lens through which you can view all of human activity since writing began. These are ground level transactional artifacts. These are original source documents, your covers, and uh, how you look at them will help you understand um, all of human history, one way or another. Uh, but anyway, uh, Jim Grau in the Air Post Journal wrote this, Postal History Exhibits, he's talking about exhibiting now, uh, the exhibits are comprised of material carried by and related to official, local, or private mails. They are organized to show the development and operations of postal routes, rates, means of transport, markings, usages, and other postal aspects, services, functions, and activities related to the history of postal services, including the development and operation. Um, Bob Oldenweller, another master of uh, philately, master of postal history, <coughs> didn't quite agree with that. He thought that uh, too many people equate a cover with postal history, where they say, I collect postal history, meaning I collect covers. Uh, unfortunately, that's not correct. What is essential is the way the cover is used in an exhibit. Again, Bob's emphasis is how this material gets displayed, like the exhibits we have next door. Um, outside of the exhibit, eh, it's just a cover. And the, the, the point that's being made is that um, no cover is automatically postal history simply because it's a cover. That's uh, that's what Jim Grau, that's what Odenweller have been talking about. I don't agree. I think there is some aspect of human society that can be ascertained by looking at anything that went through the mail. Even if it's junk mail, you can learn things about society at that point in time. Maybe not from one individual artifact, 
But if you look at the collection and accumulation and archive of similar kinds of postal documents, you will learn a lot about society at that point in time. And that's really the focus that I have uh, here. Okay. Uh, the taxonomy, these 23 points, only a few of which I'll really get to here. Uh, the type of cover or document, doesn't have to be a cover to be uh, of, of uh, postal interest. Uh, primary among the types of covers are envelopes, so really a subset. Um, the stamps on the envelope, of course, we're philatelists, we care about stamps. Postal historians tend to care, to care less about stamps than other aspects of, of that document. But the stamps, the frankings are important. Uh, what rate is paid? And there are many different ways to look at rates, some of which are incredibly uh, confounding looking back in history, trying to figure out what rate was actually paid or why that rate was paid. Um, cancellations and other kinds of indicia, you know, auxiliary markings, all of those things that are stamped or handwritten across the face of your cover. Um, requested services. There are services like registry until a few decades ago. Airmail was a requested service. Insurance, that kind of thing. Uh, so requested services is one aspect that you want to be looking at. But then there are added services which are either implicit to the postal regulations that you get whether you ask for it or not, um, or unrequested and um, sometimes undesired. An example of uh, the former category would be forwarding. That's a service that's sort of built in. S many times it's free, but in different places and at different points in time, sometimes there was a fee for forwarding mail. So, but that's still an implicitly requested service. Please forward unless I tell you not to. Um, an unrequested and in this case undesirable service, um, uh, an activity that was done to uh, mailed envelopes was censorship. And it's a service of some sort. Not, a, not one you'd want, but one you were going to get sometimes, whether you wanted it or not. Um, postal labels are a highly collectible area all by themselves, just like stamps are, uh, but they tell part of the story of your cover's journey. Uh, etiquettes and Cinderella's, um, all kinds of things that are affixed to covers that are not postally related, uh, Christmas seals and Easter seals, that kind of thing is an example. Um, then there's this, this whole other area that I will just generally dance carefully across. Senders and recipients are always subjects of, of interest. The destination or the origin may be a, a key factor in the interest level. Um, the roots, obviously, where it started, where it journeyed, how it transferred from one means of transportation to another, that kind of thing, uh, highly relevant. The date sent may be important. Obviously, a first day cover that's the only importance they have nowadays, I think. Um, but the, the date received, certain key transit date uh, markings will tell you a lot about the journey of the cover or the importance, the significance of the cover. You know, if it went through a town that was having an earthquake or something on a particular day, that's part of its uh, story. Um, events, first flight covers are a good example of an event. The, um, Largely, they're philatelic, but not necessarily. Um, but event-specific covers uh, tell part of the story. Clearly, if you've got the, the letter as well as the envelope, if you've got the contents, you know much more of the story. And there are some wonderful uh, examples in the philatelic world and, and, and you know, in the world in general about uh, archives of correspondences going back and forth between certain individuals that really paint a picture of the world at a particular point in time. There are a whole bunch of intangible cover elements, uh, things like condition, um, provenance, who owned it previously, that may be relevant for some people in, in some conditions. And then there's, once we get outside of the objects that went through the mail themselves, there's this whole category of postal documents, um, 
forms, ephemera, other forms of post office artifacts, the hand stamps themselves, a letter carrier's leather ma uh, mail bag, uh, those kinds of things that can also help tell a story. So uh, it's, a, it's a broad way of looking. It's a comprehensive way of looking uh, at individual covers. Um, I'm going to spend some time here on you know, the type of cover it is and envelopes in particular. I'm going to have to skip, however, these other areas this morning, but that doesn't make them any less important. Um, okay, so this is a sampling of under the category of type of covers what you might be uh, looking for. You might be looking at an envelope or it might be a postcard uh, or a postal card, which is different. Um, reply coupons, a lot of postcards were so sent with um, another postcard attached. When you received it, you'd tear off the reply postcard so that you could mail it back to the person who sent it to you. Actually. Nobody knew if you didn't send it back and used it for other purposes, but it, you know, it came from country A, went to country B. Country B could use it, the person who received it, to uh, send it back to country A. didn't have to be sent back to the original sender, however. Uh, folded letters, letter cards, I'll show you an example of these. Newspapers were frequently franked with a stamp and sent through the mail. Uh, more frequently, uh, newspapers were put in wrappers, and the wrappers themselves are important examples of covers. Uh, parcel cards and tags that were attached to packages where the franking and the address was put on the tag itself. Uh, baggage labels, uh, and I'm, I'm not talking about when you were going on a ship and you stored your, your luggage. I'm talking about... Um, Baggage labels on mailbags are highly collectible. Return receipts through registered and certified mail. Um, the delivery containers, if you're shipping uh, live alligators or chicks or live plants, those containers are um, highly collectible as well. And then documents are covers when there's a <coughs> revenue stamp on them. Different aspect of collecting. It's not really a postal usage. But throughout history, what we call postage stamps frequently have postage and revenue on the stamp as part of the stamp. Could be used to pay a document tax, a, a mortgage filing tax, um, pay for the tax that used to be on uh, bank checks. So documents with... Um, Revenue usage are also part of the uh, taxonomy, but this is just a sampling and, and not at all um, definitive. Within the category of just envelopes alone, we can look at postal stationery. You can look at which is pre-printed by postal authorities, sometimes with, but not always with, a stamp embedded, typically in the upper right corner or on the back flap, um, so postal stationery. Corner cards, that's the fancy word for a return address printed in the upper left corner. There are hobbyists who collect uh, corner cards from different hotels, different cities. Uh, again, a, it's going to help you tell the cover's story. Uh, advertising covers are similar, but much more expansive. It's not just the return address. The entire left side of the envelope has got pretty pictures advertising whatever the, the subject is. Uh, I'll show you examples of uh, patriotic covers and uh, Mulready's and uh, honor envelopes. We'll also touch very briefly, I think I got one example on morning covers. Um, other areas, ambulance envelopes, we won't get into any of these, but they are part of the package that if you want to receive it, I'll be sending to you. Um, postal stationery. here's a great example. Uh, 
issued by a postal administration. In this case, it's got a stamp. Oops. Got a stamp printed on it. They didn't always. Um, by the way, there's all kinds of stuff here about the postmark and the origin, information about the destination, and other descriptive material. If you see something that's of interest, stop me. <coughs> Otherwise, for the most part, I'm going to be ignoring that. Um, trying to cram a day into two hours is going to going to have a consequence of that. But anyway, uh, do stop me if you see something that's of particular interest. Here's postal stationery. Uh, this is by uh, this is an air letter, which is a folded document, and um, it's made on very lightweight, almost tissue paper. The idea being that air transportation was very expensive back then, and you had to minimize weight, so it was on a thin sheet of paper. They were frequently given preferential postal rates because of the lightness, the savings implicit in the lightness of the paper, uh, and to encourage the public to send airmail in this fashion. Um, this one, on active service, and there's no money there. There's no stamp. The military at that point in time, British military, um, gave a military concession and postage was free. There's a corner card. Here's one you probably don't see every day uh, from Jawara. Uh, up the river, up the river Gambia in West Africa, uh, you'll see a lot of Gambia material. That's probably a clue that it's one of the few things that I actually collect. Um, but um, yeah, that's a pre-printed corner card. Uh, here's an advertising cover. It's much more than a corner card. Although you do have the address embedded in there. It's really just advertising the fact that um, the Sterling Reed Organ Company sells organs. Here's patriotic cover. Usually created, not always, created during wartime. Nowadays it's hard to figure out when it's wartime and when it's not. So you may see these being issued um, in the 20th century, even when we weren't at war. Maybe we were leading up to war and patriotism was on the rise. <coughs> uh, this one goes back uh, to the Philippines and its destination was Germany. This is 1899. Um, and this is a Mulready. At the same time that Great Britain issued the first postage stamp, the Penny Black, in 1840, they issued these highly decorative designs that were prepaid. You bought them for, for uh, two pence, two pennies. One pence paid the postage, the other paid for, um, for the document itself for the envelope. <coughs> Before this, mail was sent as folded letters. The use of envelopes was not very common because postage rates back then were calculated based on the number of sheets you were sending, not the weight, not the distance. Between origins, it was the number of sheets that determined the postage rate. With the um, creation of the penny post at the same time that postage stamps were issued in 1840, all that changed because now it was by weight and um, it was a fixed weight <coughs> that provided for you to send a letter and put it in an envelope and it wouldn't have cost you anything extra. It wouldn't have doubled the uh, per sheet calculation. So these Mulready's were an innovation to try to promote the use of envelopes um, and these fancy designs were thought to really encourage people ended up being um, not popular back then 
Today, you can't buy them for love or money. They're quite expensive. But back then, they were not all that popular. And there's a whole category of study of um, the parodies that were done, the drawings that were parodies of, uh, of these Mulready envelopes. So it's a, it's a fascinating area. Were they mainly only in England or Europe? Yeah, or England. Yeah. Yeah. There were, there were other examples of postal stationery that emerged later, but the Brits were way ahead of everybody. The United States didn't get a postage stamp until 47. Um, yeah, it from 40 to 47, it took us seven years to catch on that this was a really good idea. But there were two things happening at the same time. Postage stamps to prepay postage. Otherwise, you put an envelope in the mail, you handed it to the uh, post office, the recipient was paying it. Especially for international mail, you were unable to prepay. Nobody knew what the rate was going to be on the other end. You might have paid the domestic portion. Once it went overseas, once it went to a different country, not even overseas, but you know, in Europe from one country to the next, you couldn't pay to destination early on. It was only once um, these postal... Uh, conventions came into effect that um, there were agreed upon rates point A to point B across a foreign boundary. Okay, um, I mentioned morning covers. This was something that first came about in Victorian England. Many postal innovations seem to have emanated from there. Um, Queen Victoria stayed in mourning uh, the rest of her life after the death of her uh, beloved Prince Albert. Um, every mail, every piece of letter that came from the crown, from Queen Victoria, was black banded like this. It became a fashion, it first in England, and then in a lot of places around the world, including the United States, to announce the death of um, a family member using a mourning cover. This one is kind of unique uh, in a whole variety of ways. Um, it's got some French censorship on it. It went from uh, Bathurst in, in Gambia to Côte d'Ivoire, the Ivory Coast, around the, southern, uh, around the, the tip of West Africa. So um, unusual origin, destination, um, a whole bunch of other interesting aspects to this cover that we will skip over. But um, let's try this. Uh, now here's an example of a folded letter. This one originated in, um, in Marseille, and uh, I'm sorry, in Bordeaux. And... Um, was carried privately across the channel to London where it was put aboard the, um, <coughs> the ship, the Forerunner. This is the first journey of the first ship in what became the Elder Dempster fleet in 1852. And um, this one's in my collection. I like it because I happen to collect the corporate mail of the sender, Morel et Prom. Uh, I collect Elder Dempster mail, and I collect Gambia mail. This is all three, so uh, brought together a lot of my collecting interests. But it's a folded letter, and you can see the slight scribble there, which is the rate. Um, But this is an example of opening it up. You can unfold it, and you, if you open it further, <coughs> you can see that on the flip side is all the writing. This is a uh, actually three sheets. I'm sorry, two sheets, uh, three pages. Okay, letter cards. You can s you can figure them out by these perforations, which sometimes were torn off but it's like a double-sized postcard that you would fold in half and um, 
the periphery was gummed so that you could seal it. And they were also subject to uh, special rates as well. I spoke earlier about uh, newspaper wrappers. Um, the folded newspaper would fit inside. That's actually a, a sleeve opened at, at both of the smaller ends. Newspaper would slide in. Typically it was actually, it was an open sheet that was wrapped around the newspaper and then sealed. But sometimes you saw them in tubular form uh, as well. Um, this one went from a war zone in Austria to Bucharest in Romania and um, well let's let's move on um, tags luggage tags here's somebody that was shipping keys probably in a small cloth pouch that was tied onto Tied onto that tag. These make interesting collections and stories can be told as well. Um, shipping live alligators, live chicks required a special handling stamp. So the franking here is not just about paying the postage, but about requesting the special service. What this accomplished was allowing you to send high priority, because they were living, breathing, uh, in this case animals, but you could do it for plants as well, uh, high priority merchandise, materials, at the first class, uh, at a discount rate, but at first class speed. So by paying, in this case, the 20 cents, or 10 cents in that case, um, you were achieving a lot with a what's effectively a postal rate concession and there you see a young lady uh, I don't think that alligator actually went into that that mailbox but uh, <laughs> it, w it was making a point okay uh, return receipts is another area where um, you send a letter you want to make sure it's received we still use that that form today but uh, they go back. Uh, they go back quite a ways in time. This is from 1889. Um, talk quickly about the stamps, although they are of lesser interest to postal historians than to um, the kind of philatelist that might call themselves uh, stamp collectors. Um, we'll we'll look at a few of these and not so much on things like forgeries and, and the like. Um, rate paid is, is, is much more significant from a postal history standpoint. And uh, first thing you've got to figure out is what class of mail was being used. Uh, first class mail, the item is closed. It is subject to uh, privacy at least in theory, governments have been known to breach that, that uh, explicit commitment, but um, it's closed from postal inspection. Obviously, in time of war, all those rules changed. Anything could be opened by any administration. Uh, second class mail reduced rates uh, to get certain items in the mail. Again, the government was, the governments were promoting using the mails to improve commerce. All of this, everything we're talking about today, has to do with postal authorities, meaning the government, striving to improve commerce. Interpersonal communications between individuals and their families, it's all well and good. The primary motivation for all of what we're talking about today is making sure that commerce was facilitated. And that's where a lot of these rates came from. Um, third class is bulk mail, primarily advertising material. You can't imagine 
a more perfect example of a government promoting commerce than junk mail. You might not agree with uh, <laughs> what's being promoted or the quantity of it, but from a governmental standpoint, they want to promote commerce. Advertising is critical to that. Welcome to the world of third class uh, junk mail. And then um, there are also cultural aspects to what the governments want to promote and fourth class mail was created to facilitate the movement of books. Newspapers got a second class rate, which um, was really a subsidy, really a discount, to ensure that the news would be spread throughout the land. And you could judge whether um, a particular administration was thinking about spreading the news by whether a second class, a newspaper rate, was supported during particular periods in history in particular countries. If they were repressive regimes, yeah, newspapers weren't getting any, uh, th they weren't banned from being distributed, but they had to pay the first class rate. So when you're looking at, uh, at, at seeing newspaper rates, implicit in that uh, is an open-mindedness on the part of the government to facilitate the distribution uh, of news. Um, ah, the classes of mail get very complicated. And f you know, for example, it, just looking at U.S. rates, the classic reference work during the UPU period is Tony Vavrikiewicz's um, U.S. international postal rates from 72, 1872 to 1996. Of its 13 chapters, of its 33 chapters, 17 are talking about understanding the different classes of rates. Not an easy subject. Tony's book is just wonderful, though. Um, sometimes the, the class of mail is, is not apparent, and you got to sort of back into uh, what, how it traveled, what rate it received. Here's a third class wrapper, and um, The, the interesting thing here is that rating mark which is um, 37 and a half cents. You need to be able to read these things depending on the period of time you're collecting. There are reference books that help you with this. For example, this is, this is again from Dick Winter. This is volume two on the uh, transatlantic mails. He gives examples. That's 37 and a half cents. That's 39 and a half cents. Not, a, not immediately apparent to all of us in this day and age when our children are printing if they're not typing, um, you know, how to interpret the handwriting. But you need the reference books for it. They are out there depending on what period you're collecting. Obviously, the books are different. Um, disaster rates. Uh, here's an example from the uh, Quetta, Quetta earthquake in, uh, what, 35, 1935, where the postage was free. If you dropped it into the mail, you couldn't get to the post office. Post office had been destroyed. Um, postal authorities created this postage free. This is not a common cover, by the way. Um, but it is absolutely typical of special allowances. There were special postal allowances in 1906? When was the San Francisco quake? 06. Yeah. Um, couldn't get to a post office. There was no post office. But um, uh, there was no ability to sell postage stamps right after the quake. But mail going out, mail coming in, was critical to figuring out what was going on at that point in time. Postal authorities just said, whatever works, we'll do. Um, free Frank. Okay. In, in my brand new office at the American Philatelic Center, this gem sits in a corner on display. The lights are out until you show up. They go on automatically. You don't want to bleach this. This is a Washington Free Frank. In fact, it is believed to be the earliest Washington Free Frank, 
when, um, when government officials sent mail, and this is true even today, you'll get a newsletter from your congressman. It is free, Frank. It's not paying postage. Unless he's doing something about his campaign or her campaign, the postage is free. Well, free franking uh, showed up long before George Washington came on the scene. It was common in um, postal use in Europe. But um, in, in the creation of the U.S. Post Office was the specification, president, vice president, mail coming from or going to was free. Same deal for members of both houses of Congress. Same rules apply overseas as well. But that's the earliest free frank with George Washington's signature on it. And it's a few feet from my office. Tell me I don't have the best job in the world. Um, okay, here's another example of governments treating themselves uh, to free rides through the postal system. Uh, on His Majesty's Service, OHMS, it could have been Her Majesty's Service for Victoria or Queen Elizabeth. Um, basically, it's free postage. Sometimes, there are other times like this where even the government had to pay postage. And this example is because it was a, the governor's office uh, was sending to the governor's office, um, the governor general rather, in Dakar. Um, I'm not sure the basis of this requirement that this particular envelope had to be posted, but uh, what you will see is when a collector was sending mail to a foreign post office to purchase stamps from the post office, the return envelope, that was a commercial transaction between the post office and the buyer of the stamps. The post office was franking its own mail. So there are all kinds of reasons why, um, even though it was official government communication on His Majesty's service, um, was government transaction, but it was a commercial transaction, and it paid, uh, that those kinds of envelopes paid postage. Um, here's the equivalent in the United States. Um, official business, it's always been... $300 fine, but this, this is a pre-printed envelope from the, uh, the Postal Department, Post Office Department, the Office of the Third Assistant Postmaster General. And um, Postal Service, it was free. Um, here's another example of the same thing where because of the nature of the transaction, the nature of the contents, even though it was a government um, called penalty envelope, official business, right? It says official business, but they still paid postage. Uh, retaliatory rates, that's when postal agreements between two postal authorities break down. And uh, this was a period in time when um, Great Britain um, had created a contract, the first contract across the ocean with the Cunard Line in 1840. Again, a lot was going on in the 1840s. And uh, they were charging uh, a shilling or 24 cents to get mail across the ocean on a Cunard liner. All right, so it was a postal contract with a shipping company at a particular rate. United States said, hey, this looks like a good deal. We're going to create um, a contract with our own U.S. shipping company for mail between here and England. And um, you could prepay the 24 cents, the equivalent of the one shilling. All of a sudden, Great Britain said, oh, we don't want competition on this route. We're not going to recognize that 24 cents as paying the postage. So they would charge U.S. envelopes that came over on American bottom ships, well, one, one shipping line, um, as though it was an unpaid letter. 
the U.S. said, oh, well, if you're going to do that, we're not going to recognize the shilling that's prepaid coming over on the Cunard line. And they started uh, charging these penalty rates. If it comes across on a Cunard line unpaid, uh, it's now like a, uh, a 39 cent damage instead of what would have been 24 cents. So they came up with this series of retaliatory rates. That lasted for a couple of years because post offices weren't being hurt by this. The consumers of postal services were being hurt. So these retaliatory rates were breaking down um, communications and people were getting angry. It took two years for the postal authorities uh, to get off their high horses and, and, and agree um, uh, to um, avoid the retaliatory rates, to agree on, on postal rates. And the U.S. basically won that because the Brits conceded that mail on either set of ships was accepted as prepaid or at the, uh, the agreed upon rate. Um, overweight mail? Mm -hmm. yeah, here's an example of where even though it was franked properly as a first class postage uh, envelope, it was overweight and a postage due stamp was applied but the recipient of all things, the collector of internal revenue, said, I'm not paying this, so it was sent back to the sender. The last place you want to send the postage to a short paid envelope is to the IRS. All right. Um, we're not really going to get into um, these other aspects uh, of rates, but recognize that um, that they're out there. Um, let's take a a look at um, cancellations, and the earliest cancellations were manuscript scribbles. Why do you want to cancel a stamp so it wouldn't be reused? All right, and one of the big arguments against introducing postage stamps was that folks were going to erase cancellations and reuse the stamps. Theft of postage was the big counter argument to the issuance of postage stamps. Um, in addition to manuscript cancels, there's a whole group of fancy cancels that are out there. Some stamps were pre-canceled, where the city name, city and state, appears on the face of the stamp with little parallel lines running across. Those are pre-cancels. Um, Ship letters um, had their own sets of hand stamps or indications. These were the early mail before there were ship contracts, mail contracts with ships. And this, is, this was part of the subject I, uh, I spoke about uh, earlier. Uh, slogans, basically the postal authorities, including advertising, you know, uh, buy our coconuts, visit our country, uh, all kinds of things about um, promoting, again, promoting commerce domestically through the use of cancellations. Ah, forgery. So many, y you can take a genuine stamp, put it on an envelope, and um, put a phony cancellation on it to try and create a, um, a faked piece of postal history. Forgery exists on stamps, of course, but in the realm of, of uh, postal history, it's one of the things we, we are most careful to watch out for. Um, forwarding agents, in the early formative years of the development of postal distribution networks, there were private companies that were initially involved in freight forwarding that also had to help with getting the mail to the nearest post office if there wasn't a link, uh, uh, that, that 1852 cover I showed you uh, for the Elder Dempster line, it was a French forwarding agent that took the cover from Bordeaux across the channel to London and got it into the postal system at that point in time. There's no evidence of how they were compensated on the face of that envelope, but there's no question that... Um, that they were, they were being paid uh, for that service. So forwarding agents 
a very important aspect of uh, early mail, and by early mail, I would say up to 1875. Um, other aspects that you can look at, aging and damaging can and damaged cancelers, misuse of the mails, war-related things like army post offices and field post offices, uh, and, and a number of other considerations. Uh, here's some examples of manuscript cancels. And they could simply be just a scribbling out. And since the post office today seems to have forgotten how to cancel packages, frequently your mailman will take a, dr um, a Sharpie pen and do the same thing they were doing in the 1840s and 1850s. And then there were cancellations like this where it was actually dated and sometimes even signed by uh, the postal clerk. At that point in time, the postal clerk was typically the postmaster. It was a, a one-person office back then. Okay. Um, here's a pre-cancel. Interestingly enough, it's a pre-cancel on a postage due stamp. There's a complicated story behind that one that I can't really go into now, but the idea is that um, it was expedient for either postal authorities or the users of large amounts of postage stamps to have them pre-canceled so that they wouldn't have to go through that cancellation sorting process, that helped expedite the mail. If the post office is famous for one thing, it's always striving to expedite, to speed. Uh, what's that? To get rid of it. To get rid of it. <laughs> well, uh, the idea... The idea in the world of, of business and the post office, whether it's for profit or not, is a business. Uh, the idea is better, faster, cheaper. In the 1950s and 60s, there was a saying, uh, better, faster, cheaper. If you control two of those, you will dominate the market. Nowadays, you have to be able to deliver all three in order to stay in business. Forget about market dominance. Well. It the 50s and 60s were an exception to the rule because it was always, I need to be better, faster, and cheaper in order to succeed. The post office is a perfect example of that. Uh, so here we see pre-cancels in action uh, as a means of facilitating uh, postal expediency. Um, here's some example of uh, ship letter markings. And um, these are just a scan from a book called Robertson Revisited, a study of the maritime postal markings of the British Isles. It was written by Colin Tabert. He's written oh, at least a dozen books on ship mail in, in my course earlier this week. I, I relied extensively on him. Uh, here, for example, uh, is a Deal ship letter. Came into the port of Deal, unpaid, and... Um <coughs> It this, this came up from Africa and is Wesleyan missionary mail. Missionaries throughout history were among the biggest communicators. After um, branches of corporations overseas, the missionaries were the ones that were sending mail home uh, and receiving mail back. Um, letting the home office know what was going on or begging to be relieved of duty because um, I, I can't take any more of this heat or, you know, my wife and children, literally, my wife and children just died. I need to come home. You know, the, the white man's graveyard in, in Africa was, uh, was famous for killing off missionaries indiscriminately. The fact that you were uh, running a mission of God didn't stop the diseases from killing you. So uh, a lot of missionary mail. And of course, because it's missionary mail, the, the recipient back home, the home office, retained all of this as archival information. That explains why so much missionary mail is available today. Um, slogan cancels, you can see, the, you know, these are promoting either different postal services, um, or promoting the country, 
you know, buy books of stamps, spend your next holiday in East Africa, so on and so forth, using the correct address, speeds, delivery, those, those kinds of things. And here you can see examples of them on stamp. Buy U.S. savings bonds. Um, buy Trinidad petrol and so forth. Uh, forgery is so common that it's become a specialized area of collecting. Um, Madame Joseph was a forger during World War II. Uh, it was a he, not a she. But um, I believe that Madame Joseph was uh, a true hero of the World War II period. He was issuing forged passports to help Jews get out of Europe. After the war, he came over to the United Kingdom where if you came into his stamp shop and said, I'm looking for an envelope with a particular cancellation, he says, well, I don't happen to have it in stock. If you come back tomorrow, I'll have one for you. And um, they're, they're brilliant forgeries. The one that confuses me the most is uh, one that's in my collection. It's a stamp that was issued, uh, Silver Jubilee, that was issued in 1935. Cancellation was from 1919. Doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, and, and he was better than that. The entire archive of canceling devices was purchased by a couple of stamp dealers, and I believe they are now in the possession of the Royal Philatelic Society London to keep new creations uh, off the market. Um, forwarding agents I mentioned earlier. There's the forwarding agents mark there. Uh, C. DeVoe and Company, London, was the London branch of a uh, freight forwarding firm in Bordeaux. Didn't you have some with Pony Express too? I'm sorry? Didn't you have some with Pony Express too? Oh, sure. The Pony Express was... Um, a big forwarding agent here. They were, well, they were in the West. Yeah. But, um, yeah, the, the Pony Express was a non-postal organization, a private shipping organization that was taking mail across the Badlands. Um, okay. Um, Let's skip over those and talk about requested services. The most obvious of those is register, but airmail, until airmail became standard, was a requested uh, service. Express mail has been around for a long time, you know, long before FedEx came around uh, and thought they invented something new. Express mail goes back to the 1800s. Um, insurance, you could buy insurance uh, for a, a fee. AR, which is French for return receipt requested. Also special handling like those uh, chickens and alligators. Uh, COD is a service that some of you may have experienced uh, in the past. Um, notifications of the fragility of the item as well. Um, as far as registered mail is concerned, this is a piece of postal stationery, postal stationery where on the back flap there was a prepaid two pence, two pennies, which was the registry fee. It's not a rate, wasn't dependent on anything um, other than requesting the service. Fixed price didn't make any difference. How large the envelope was, what direction it was going. If it was international, there was an international registry fee. Sometimes the domestic and international were the same. So, um, the postage was, was not included on the envelope. You had to frank it yourself. Sometimes these kinds of envelopes are called uprated because in addition to the stamp that appears there, you, know, you, you put on a, an additional stamp. That's, that's an incorrect use of the term uprated. This is paying a fee. That is paying, in this case, domestic postage. So it's a registered envelope. You paid the tuppence prepaid the tuppence for the fee, and you put on whatever posters was required to get your, uh, your envelope delivered. 
Um, airmails. The airmail etiquettes themselves are highly collectible. The number of designs that exist is, is just huge. Some of them are pretty fancy, like um, that doesn't look like a heck of a modern plane, but there's your flight steward. At that time, they were all stewards male. Um, But I guess beginning in what, 18, 1918 in the United States, uh, earlier elsewhere, uh, post offices began experimenting with using aircraft to deliver the mail. And uh, you'll excuse the expression, it took off immediately. Um, I'm sorry. Okay, Express was just what the, what the name suggests. There's no question but that um, people wanted, certain people wanted their mail to get through as fast as possible. One way to do that was to purchase a surplus, uh, a special surplus service uh, called Express Mail. And here you can see like a one shilling stamp plus two pence, one shilling two. Um, that was eight pence um, eight pence for the airmail fee. It was six pence for the express fee. Eight and six is 14 or a shilling two. It is not often that you see a shilling stamp used on a first class, if you will, single envelope. Mostly the shilling stamps are used for heavier mail. This was a single weight envelope that paid uh, the airmail rate and the express fee. Here's one that goes back a few years that includes both a library rate, which is even cheaper than the media mail rate, um, plus it was sent insured mail with trackability. And this one was sent uh, from the American Philatelic Research Library to me. It had books. I wanted them quickly. Um, they said we, it's too expensive to do it quickly. But these are very valuable books. I was very fortunate back then. They actually let me borrow those books. Um, so figuring out how all this different is four dollars and I can't even see what that is but um, it was an expensive piece to mail but it included an insurance which is not a fee. Insurance is a rate. It's based on the value of the contents. Uh, AR, return receipt requested. This was a, uh, a registered letter that had a uh, AR um, hand stamped onto it. And here you can see, uh, this is not from the same, same envelope, but um, here you can see the front and back of the uh, return receipt. Again, highly collectible. Really tells you a big part of the story. You will... It's extremely unlikely that you're going to have a cover and be able to match it to the receipt because they went in opposite directions. You know, the, the envelope and, uh, and the receipt went together over to the recipient. The... That, that coupon, that re, uh, return receipts, then torn off, autographed, and shipped back to the sender. So they're at opposite ends of wherever the, the envelope went. Uh, Parent and child cottage. Parent, Parent child. child. Yes, 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 yes. Abs <laughs> absolutely. Um, my parents never sent me anything with a return receipt, but uh, I suppose that's a possibility, yes. 
kind of bad postage bill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the laundry they're sending. Rocks. <laughs> okay, so um, again, special handling. The, the fee varied over time depending on how much the post office wanted to encourage its use. Um, now here you see special handling on an envelope that was otherwise two cents for half penny postage stamps. Uh, it'd be my contention that's a philatelic piece. There was no reason to put special handling on an envelope. It wasn't specially handling anything. In contrast to this, where it's sending live chicks. We're sending live chicks at um, effectively at a fourth class rate, but with first class service. That's what the special handling stamp accomplished. And then something of more recent vintage is this uh, special handling fragile notation. I can't imagine why you would want special handling for something that isn't fragile. Um, but the post office came out with this when? In 2015. Okay, so... Oh, yes, there was, there was an additional uh, fee, not a rate. There was an additional fee associated uh, with the, uh, the, the request for that fragile service. Um, there's another label that I couldn't in include for s the special handling of cremated remains. Those could be human or pet, but... Uh, and that's changing, by the way. September 30th, there's a new rate and a new label for the sending of cremated remains. If you want the old label, you have to go to your post office and hurry because they're, they're printing the new. The old label is a dull gray appropriate to cremated remains. The, uh, the new label is a bright orange, festive. I'm not quite sure what they're trying to communicate with that, but there you have it. Anyway, added services like forwarding, as I mentioned, missent mail. Uh, has to be specially processed. This is where the, primarily where the government screwed up and sent it the wrong way, the Postal Service did. Uh, redirected mail, um, returned mail, returned through a, uh, either returned or a dead letter office, uh, advertised when something shows up in a dead letter office frequently, post office, especially back 50 years and earlier, would advertise that they've got these envelopes. If one of these is for you, come get it. They had to advertise by law. Uh, censored mail, as I mentioned, uh, mail held for a variety of reasons. Um, here's forwarded mail. This thing bounced around quite a bit. Um, unless you say something like return after so many days or do not forward, the presumption is that the mail is going to be forwarded. And um, here we have one that uh, traveled from Las Palmas in the Canary Islands to headed south to Cameroon on the west coast of Africa, bounced up to uh, Gambia, went over to Calabar River in Nigeria, uh, Gori in Senegal, which is not far from Bathurst. It's about 80 miles away. Um, and finally ended up being returned um, to the sender in Berlin. So the sender started with a uh, Canary Islands location but put a return address in Germany. So no, I don't know. Obviously it was either a businessman or a tourist visiting the Canary Islands but put his home return address in, in Germany. Um, the letter wandered around. The recipient couldn't be found. But but look at the, I mean, if you just look at the, the route this thing took, all the places it visited at no extra charge, right? The post office was doing its darndest to get the mail through. Um, they make for some interesting stories. Uh, Miss sent to Hanover, New Hampshire. Now, now here, um, the... Um, Republic of South Africa is bragging about automated uh, mail processing, how wonderful it is. 
and it ended up going to Hanover, New Hampshire, despite the fact that it was being sent to the University of Pennsylvania. My explanation of this is that this was somebody applying to both business schools from South Africa, and um, although he got the address right, he got the zip code wrong, because that's, um, that's business school in New Hampshire. Everything else, and 19104 is Pennsylvania, is Philadelphia. Um, so <laughs> this may have been automated mail sorting, but it didn't work because it ended up going to New Hampshire first instead of uh, uh, the Wharton School. Wharton School eventually got it. I have no information as to whether this guy was accepted at either school, by the way. <laughs> Someday I'm going to do a study of that, by the way. Um, I have a collection of applications from around the world heading to the Wharton School, which is my alma mater, and uh, how they managed to release all of these things. But probably 70 different nations. I've got no idea how many of those were for applications that were accepted to the MBA program. One of these days I'm going to do, do a, a highly specialized postal history study. Talk about narrow interests. Anyway, um, redirected mail. This thing was originally sent to New South Wales per the sender's instructions. Only that's an address in uh, South Wales. So this thing went all the way uh, hippity hop from West Africa to Australia before somebody figured out no, the guy must have meant England, and uh, it made its way back to England, which gets this uh, not known in Newcastle. Mm -hmm. um, it may, it may <laughs> makes it an uncommon uh, indicium. Okay, returned and dead letter offices. The difference between a return letter office and a dead letter office is that once it gets into a dead letter office, it's not likely to emerge until some postal historian gets his or her mitts on it. Uh, a returned letter office or a return letter branch, um, they're actually successful in tracking down the sender. Um, but the collecting of those marks is um, uh, one aspect of, of telling the story uh, of postal history. So here we say, we see not known, below that is the French word in Kanu. French is the language of the Postal Service. The UPU was founded um, in Switzerland, but in, this, in the French section of Switzerland, and French was adopted as the international language of the Postal Services. So you will see frequently bilingual marks where the other language is French, you know, you got the n the native language of whatever the country of origin is, and then you got the same thing in French. That's why, because everybody was expected to read French. Uh, everybody meaning postal clerks and postmasters. Um, but on the back is this returned letter branch from 1926. That's there's only two known examples of that mark. So the marks themselves can can not only tell a story but can also make an envelope uh, a bit more valuable. Um, <laughs> here you see an example of an um, envelope that ended up in the dead letter office after bouncing around quite a bit. And the post office put an ad in the local paper. This is 1833. Post office at uh, Shikari, which I think is in New York. Um, and they were advertising all the different names of addressees that they could not locate. If you picked up a letter from the dead letter office after it was advertised, there was a one cent or two cent advertising fee that you paid when you picked up your envelope. Okay, censoring as a... Um, 
As a service is one of those things you don't want, but sometimes you have no choice and you will get it. Um, obviously in times of war or civil unrest, but censorship can be done by the military, can be done by a civilian censorship authority, or very rarely by postal authorities themselves. Civil censors were not employees of the post office. They were employees of uh, basically the War Department of the different nations. So you can't assume that the post office was doing this censorship. If it wasn't military censorship, but civilian, they were civilian employees of war departments uh, or similar kinds of organizations uh, around the world. Postal labels, including uh, requested service labels like airmail, for example. Postal seals, if an envelope is split open, the post office will seal it for you. Um, routing code symbols would be affixed to a stamp. Sometimes, even today, you will see a bright round label with a letter C or D or A or something. That's a uh, routing code. Um, facing slips, I'll show you an amazing example of what a facing slip is. Uh, tax stamps, um, custom stamps. The most common kind of label you might run into is a registered mail label. That capital R is a pretty much universal requirement for registered mail. And here you'll see it on a uh, Mexican label as well. So... Um, and there's, by the way, it, this one is actually pointing to its U the UPU specification that requires that, that capital R. Doesn't have to be a label. It can be hand stamp with a capital R. Sometimes they're in oval circles or round circles or whatever. But um, yeah, an example of a requested service label. Um, here you see... Um, an insurance label. Doesn't say the word insurance, but that V stands, uh, again, for French, valeur déclarée. You, you can tell I can't speak French. Um, declared value. And then down below, it was insured for 24 pounds. So um, the insurance fee was paid, and that label was the indication that that had taken place. Um, other kinds of requested services, parcel post labels. This one was actually cut off. There's a stamp missing over there, which is unfortunate, but since it's the only one of those labels ever seen, it's the discovery copy. I'm not in too great a period of mourning over it, but yeah, uh, be on the lookout for partial post labels. They um, also tell part of the story and some can be um, highly collectible. Um, when an envelope is split open, either through rough use in transit or crashes or wrecks, the envelope needs to be resealed. And here are some examples uh, on a Greek envelope. This is from Great Britain, found damage and officially secured. Uh, this one is from Uruguay. And it, seen up close, it's just a gorgeous, stunning label. It's embossed and well-designed. And it's, it's got these, um, look at the, the different, really, perforations around, around the margins there. This is the post office saying, we're sorry that this got damaged, but we're giving it loving care now that it's in our hands. There was an implicit message in designing a label with that much care that... Um, uh, it's not, though. No. Uh, there are two symbols that look very similar. And that's not the medical one. Okay. Yeah. 
uh, I do have the whole story. What's left of my memory isn't retaining it, but um, but yeah, um, it is. However, just so telling as to what the post office had and what they're trying to communicate subtly. You know, it's a it's a damaged envelope. You're spending so much effort and time designing and then printing. This was, you know, it's an embossed document. Those are not cheap to make. They got no compensation for it. They're just telling you, we're now in charge. Don't worry. Or don't worry anymore. Um, this one is spectacular. Uh, it's a facing slip. When you put a bunch of mail together as a postal authority, you would put a facing slip on the top. To, so that all of those things were going to be routed to the same destination. Well, this one is from the Titanic. And a um, gentleman by the name of Oscar Woody, a loyal postal employee, was busy bundling mail when the Titanic went down. He took this along with a few of the envelopes that he'd bundled together put it in his pocket. The only reason this is recovered is that he had a life preserver on. It was taken off his body. But he was going to get that mail through even if he didn't get through. This was at auction, I don't know, three, four years ago. I think it went for about seven or $8,000. Certainly tells a story. Okay. Um, Etiquettes and Cinderella's, airmail etiquettes, the things that say airmail in the upper left corner. Um, government seals, similar to the kinds I just showed you. Wafer seals, I'll show you some examples of those, as well as patriotic Christmas seals. Um, but here's some airmail seals for you, uh, uh, airmail etiquettes for you. And they, they send all kinds of different messages. Um, Air New Zealand. Um, this is a personal etiquette from an individual, but he knew he was going to be sending a lot of airmail. Another specialized one. The one that, that totally blows my mind, and do I have it? Um, yeah, there it is. Snail airmail? I have no idea what that's about. But I wouldn't mind having a cover with that, that one on it, okay? Um, all right, so etiquettes and Cinderella's are, are interesting in themselves. Government and corporate seals are not sealing to repair damage, but they are put on the back flap, very much like you used to see the old wax seals. Of course, the old wax seals had some weight to them as well as some fragility. Um, so paper seals were used both by governments. Here's the uh, Consulate General of the Republic of Liberia in Germany. The love of liberty brought us here. All right, so uh, German consulate is using that as a seal for all of the mail emanating from the Liberian, uh, their Liberian uh, consulate. Uh, here's a bank which is using an official seal to give you confidence as the recipient that we're a serious bank. Uh, wafer seals, very interesting area of collection. There's a specialized website um, and hundreds upon hundreds of, of different wafer seals um, Again, used to seal folded letters, not so much envelopes back then when these were popular, but another interesting area. Uh, patriotic seals. The Spitfire Fund. During World War II, uh, throughout the British colony, you saw labels like this being sold to raise money to buy Spitfires for the Air Force, for the British Air Force. Um, and the thing down below says, uh, we realize in Gambia what we owe to British aircraft. Uh, 
So you see a lot of messages like this, especially in wartime, uh, and mostly used for fundraising. There's, uh, I mean, that's from my country, from Gambia, but um, you've got them from India, from Southeast Asia, pretty much everywhere uh, throughout the British Empire. I'm sorry? Burma China Lido Road. Burma China? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, okay. Senders and recipients can make or break a story. Um, and whether you're looking at a person or an organization um, or a business name or the nature of the communication, the senders and the recipients. Um, are an important aspect when you're analyzing a cover. For example, and again, this is a morning cover. You can tell from the black outer marks. Um, the sender is a member of the House of Bourbon in Spain. And this was sent in 38 during the, the Troubles in Spain. And here's the here's the front of it. Um, you can see the military censorship from Seville on the front, and it was sent to uh, a princess in Petropolis, which is part of Brazil, city in Brazil. A lot of the expatriates of royal families had left Europe. And we're, we're talking about um, uh, French and Portuguese and some of the Spanish royal families. And they all fled, many of them fled, to, um, to Brazil. And that enclave is still there today in Brazil. So um, you will find much royalty. Uh, what's, what's the... The phrase, you know, the pretender to the throne. There are many pretenders uh, that are still living uh, in Petropolis. Um, I did a little exploration on this cover, trying to figure out who was being mourned and why. Well, uh, a few weeks before this was sent, it turns out that one of the young members of this royal family had gone to the U.S. He was a, a young guy in his 20s. Um, and he was living the wild life. They're, they, they took their money with them somehow or other. They were not impoverished when they, when they fled Europe. But he was living in the United States. He was driving a race car. He had a pretty minor accident. And... A week or so later, he passed away. Why did he pass away? From a minor traffic accident? He was a hemophiliac, which was characteristic of so many of the royal families because of their intermarrying and staying close together. Hemophilia was a major problem among the royal families. So digging into a cover like this, I mean, today we can do it with Google searches, right? Digging into a cover like this can tell you so much about why it was sent, who sent it, who the recipient was. Um, this princess, by the way, Princess Teresa, was a very beloved individual. And when she passed away in uh, 2011, not all that long ago, right, from this is, I mean, this is a wartime cover, right? But she passed away uh, in, uh, in 2011. Um, much of Brazil went into mourning, not just in that one little town. Much of Brazil went into mourning. So there's huge stories that can be extracted from simple little envelopes like this. Um, this is a pretty powerful example of what one can learn uh, from a cover, either the sender or the recipient, or in this case, both. Um, this was an emigration cover from an organization 
in Hungary and it was sent to Council for Immigration and Colonization over in Brazil. They, the organization in Hungary was seeking to get Jews out in 1939. This was a letter requesting permission for the entry of, of Jews into Brazil um, in uh, April of 1939. So things were already getting ugly. They knew it was going to be a bad time. This cover tells a very powerful story. Um, destinations and origins, are they unusual? Um, or the, is the pairing unusual? Is like that first morning cover I showed you from Bathurst, from Gambia to Cote d'Ivoire. You, know, you don't see pairings like that often. Uh, also, uh, clandestine, secret, or undercover mail is another area of uh, really intriguing um, postal history study. Here's one that um, traveled from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil in 1938 um, up to Macau, out to Macau. So its journey was across the South Atlantic, up the west coast of Africa, and um, landed in Stuttgart, then headed south again through Italy and across India and Asia to get to Macau. Here's something that I think is yeah, just about just about as interesting, and we'll see this a couple of times in the 15 minutes we have left, but uh, this one went from Canton, China, to Hong Kong, Brindisi, Paris, Marseille, to Stuttgart, back to Marseille. There's a whole story in why it needed to do that. Valencia in Spain, Sevilla in Spain, Las Palmas in the Canary Islands, down to Gambia, to Fernando... La Fernando de Narona, which is an island 200 miles off the coast of Brazil. It was quicker to do that than it was to take the, the uh, document straight to Natal and from there to Sao Paulo in Brazil. That was quite a journey in uh, the 1930s. Um, clandestine mail. The gentleman who's the recipient of this, a Dr. Godard, was a Belgian spy based in the UK during the war. And Post Office Box 218 is now known pretty widely to have been a, uh, a drop point for, uh, for spy communications. So this thing came from Argentina and um, followed that same trip I was just talking about, basically a Deutsche Lufthansa route across South Atlantic and then up into Europe, uh, and then got over um, to, um, to Great Britain where it was received by this individual. So a very interesting piece of postal history. So a lot, lot known about uh, Dr. Uh, Godart and uh, you can weave this document, this postal artifact, into his story and expand it. We can learn more about history through postal history, and here's a perfect example of it. Uh, routes at the heart of it. Uh, rerouting is an important aspect, especially during wartime. You've got all sorts of examples of delays um, or just events that that occur because there were changes in who was operating mail routes at certain points in time. Let's go back to this this cover from Canton. If you look up here, the original own the original sender had said by KLM service. KLM, All right. KLM. Um, and postal authorities crossed it out. Why? Because that time of year, KLM wasn't running its routes. 
So they had to know to send it by Imperial. It took a totally different route as a result, managed to get through, but um, it points to a number of things. Number one, the fluidity of services at various points in time, the dynamics with which those services um, delivery mechanisms changed, but also how important it was that postal authorities be kept informed. Nowadays, we've got the internet, things are immediate in the 30s, whether you're talking about the 1930s or the 1830s. How did that information get communicated? Yes, you see examples of weird routes that occurred because some postal clerk made an uh, error of judgment and sent things a, a strange way. But for the most part, 90x percent, 99 percent of the time, these things always went by the quickest way, the most efficient way possible. The postal clerks had to be able to figure out not, not only who was sailing when, but which sailing would make the most sense for all the connections for international mail. This was no easy task. Much easier today, but it was no easy task. Yeah. Okay, uh, the cancellation cities, whether we're talking about origin, the transit marks or destinations, or some combination thereof, are <coughs> important in themselves. <coughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to have time to talk about it. Hopefully, I'll have voice. Here are all the different means of transport, well, a few of the different means of transportation that I've identified. It all started, of course, with runners, and then ox carts, and so on. But there's a interesting variety shown here. Uh, let me focus on just a few of them, however. I can't resist a camel caravan. And here, here you have an example. Um, you don't see them all that often, running from one one area to another, but this is um, French group type stamps, paying the postal rate, the, the postcard rate, from um, the small village at the time of Timbuktu, you've heard that before, in the French Sudan in 1902, to Algiers in Algeria. Um, journey took more than seven months, and I'm sure the camels were tired by the end of it. Um, Ship mail. Anybody know the name of the captain of the first ship that carried intercontinental, interocean, transoceanic mail? Not a bad guess. Christopher Columbus. Ferdinand and Isabella gave him a letter to deliver to the Emperor of Japan. As far as we can tell, that letter never made it. Um, but it was written, was written in Spanish and I think Greek and Hebrew. Not Japanese, but they were, they were going to give it their best effort. So they had a trilingual communication to the Emperor of Japan that Columbus carried on his first flight. Uh, first flight, first sailing. I guess it was a flight for them. Uh, but here's a couple of examples of very early mail. The Mexicans were prime movers here. Um, this one is from San Juan Bautista, which is near Valparaiso in Mexico, to Seville in 1513. This is, the, uh, this is an early eastbound letter. The earliest is from 1509, the earliest that we have record of. Um, and here's a westbound envelope from uh, Carlos I of Spain, who was the Holy Roman Emperor at that time. And you can see up here it says, Por el Rey, from the king. That's a dynamite cover. It was addressed to uh, the Bishop of Mexico, who was a pretty cool dude. He brought the first printing press to North America. 
um, pneumatic mail, using pneumatic tubes, just like you do at the drive up to your bank when you're making a deposit in the drive up window. Um, pneumatic tubes that were intended to avoid um, city traffic and congestion. Underground tubes were built by the post office between different post offices. And you'll see a lot of mail that's crushed because it was crammed into these little carriers to move through the pneumatic tubes. Um, that's, th that's the uh, cancellation that tells you that it was in a uh, Berlin uh, pneumatic system. Zeppelin mail, always popular, always very popular. Um, not all of it philatelic, much of it, but the volumes of mail that were carried overseas were uh, carried overseas on Zeppelins were just huge. So not all of it could possibly have been philatelic. It was all um, predominantly commercial, really. Uh, this is the route I've been talking about, uh, the Deutsche Lufthansa route. There was a competitive French route, and basically they, were they would station a catapult ship in the middle of the ocean because the, the uh, aircraft couldn't make it all the way across the uh, South Atlantic. So uh, that puppy was sitting in a steam-driven catapult, got launched at, um, oh, I don't know, 90 miles an hour. Poor pilot. Um, all right, we're going to have to move on because we're running out of time here. But um, sometimes the name of the vehicle is important. This is crash mail from the, um, from the Hindenburg. And um, date relevance is critical on some of these things. Calendars are a uh, cause of great concern. The Russians stayed on the Julian calendar to 1914 when the rest of the world had been on the Gregorian calendar for many decades. It was a 13-day difference between the two. So you could see mail arrive in Russia with a backstamp arrival that's earlier than the cancellation date. Um, you know, impossible dates like November 31st are possible. I'm going to have to skip through. Oh, I don't want to skip through this. Wait a second. Here's a cover I love. So you talk about first flights. Um, this is first flight from Kitty Hawk. This was sent from um, Wilbur Wright to his bicycle shop employee, uh, Henry uh, Colts. And it's an amazing piece. And it's a complete send up. There was no first flight cover from the first flight at Kitty Hawk. Um, this this was done by a well-known, but who shall remain nameless, postal historian, uh, as a send-up as a joke. Um, okay, I'm going to have to skip through key events. And let me end with this one. We are all concerned with things like the earliest known date and the last known date of use. So we've got EKUs and LKUs, and we all worry about I have this new concept. Uh, here is uh, an interrupted mail cover from the Starship Enterprise. You can see it was interrupted by that hand holding it. That was the nature of the interruption. Um, I assert that this is the most future known use of airmail. And I could go on for another hour but uh, I don't have the time, unfortunately. So thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate your having been here. Thanks. And again, if you, uh, if you send me your uh, email, give me your email address or take my business card and send me an email, I'll get you the complete set of material I was using today.